Everyone wants to get better at things. In fact, our lives kind of depend on it. Whether it's learning new skills to get your dream job, directions in a new town, or an instrument that you've always dreamed of playing, learning is at the core of it. But why is it that despite years of practicing some things, you don't actually get any better? Take writing, for example. You've probably been writing every day since you were six or seven years old, but you've probably not gotten much better since you were a teenager. All of those years of practice, but no improvement. And this shows that there's more to learning than practice alone. In this book, the author explains that there's three factors you must master to get better at anything. Firstly, most of what we know comes from other people. To learn something ourselves, we need to see exactly how someone else does it, not just how they say they do it. Then we need to practice doing it ourselves. But not just any practice will work, some actually does more harm than good. And finally, we need to get feedback. And not just theoretical yes or no's, we need real world feedback. And this book builds on the author's last book, Ultra Learning. But instead of just focusing on intense learning projects, this shows practical methods for improving learning that anyone can use in any situation. And as with his last book, it's incredibly well researched. The methods are based on extensive scientific research and the author's personal experiences. So in this video, I'll first explain the three factors for improvement, and then I'll share my favourite practical tips from the book that you can implement right now. So let's talk about the first factor, seeing. As humans, we're incredibly good at learning through imitation. For example, babies learn to walk and speak by watching adults and copying them. But this ability has its drawbacks. If we're in an environment where we don't have people to copy, we find it much harder to make progress. And this is why it took almost 20 years for Tetris players to get really good. It wasn't until they had access to a much bigger network of players thanks to the internet that they could suddenly improve. And no amount of practice alone could make the original players as good as the new players, because they could learn from each other. And I think that really shows that we need to prioritise finding ways to learn from others. There's a couple of concepts from the book that help with this. Firstly, the concept of cognitive load theory. This sounds complicated, but it just means that we have a limited amount of working memory to solve problems, like a computer with limited RAM. As we have too many things to process at once, our brains max out and we stop being able to learn. So it's important that we don't overload our brains too early in the learning process. We have to start with the basics and build up from there. But our working memory isn't the only reason for this. The author also argues that success, not failure, is the best teacher. We do learn from our mistakes, but successes build our motivation because they fuel our belief in self-efficacy. And self-efficacy just means how good you believe you are at a specific thing. We generally rate our abilities individually. You might say I'm good at maths, but I'm not a language person. However, this belief is mainly based on our past experiences rather than our actual natural ability. So to keep ourselves motivated, it helps to get little wins early on in the learning process. And that's another reason that it's so important to start simply and then build up. However, the part of this section that surprised me the most is that experts aren't always great teachers. When we get really good at something, we skip steps on autopilot. Unfortunately, this also leads to experts skipping steps when they explain things too. The processes have become so automatic that they forget some steps, even if they do them all. You can combat this by getting an expert to do the task themselves and talking through it as they go. It'll make them much less likely to skip steps and gives you a chance to see how they think. And this point in particular is something we can all use, both when learning and teaching. But being able to learn from others is just the first step. We also need to practice ourselves. There's a few reasons for this. First, practice reduces the amount of mental effort required to do a task. Think about driving. When you first start, it requires all of your attention, but over time, it does slowly become automatic. Secondly, practicing forces you to remember things about the skill regularly, and retrieving this information regularly is an incredibly powerful way to strengthen your long-term memory. And finally, some skills you just can't learn by watching. You could watch golf for your entire life, but you'd get no better until you start swinging the club yourself and seeing how it feels. So how do we practice effectively? As we discussed in the last section, the first step is making sure we practice at the right difficulty level. And from there, the author explains that quality comes from quantity. The fastest way to improve at something is to focus on your quantity of output, rather than agonizing over perfecting each attempt. Interestingly, this is true for not only learning, but also achieving at the highest level. Studies have shown that scientists and artists that produce a lot of exceptional works simply produce more overall. They have the same success rate as their peers, but they produce more papers and pieces, so they get more wins. So I definitely need to remember that quantity and not perfectionism is how I'll get that high quality in the long run. But the most interesting chapter in this section is that the mind is not a muscle. This old saying is a nice idea, but apparently it's not very accurate. For example, lifting weights will strengthen a muscle, which will let you lift more of anything in the future. But the mind doesn't work like that. Brain training games are proven to have absolutely no effect on improving overall mental abilities. And one of them even got sued for claiming it did. Our brains can't really transfer things we learn in one context to another. So when we practice, we need to make it as specific and as close as possible to what we want to achieve. It sounds obvious, but if you want to learn to ask for directions in Spanish, practice doing that. Don't practice learning other random Spanish words on an app, even though that's more fun. These techniques will make your practice as effective as possible but they're not enough on their own. Getting immediate and accurate feedback is vital to improve and reach peak performance levels. So how do we do it? Well, firstly, we're generally pretty terrible at judging how effective things are ourselves. Humans often misreport how effective their training is, or even how good they are at something. 
So it helps to track and analyze your performance and progress in a spreadsheet rather than relying on your intuition. Track your decisions, your outcomes, and most importantly, your confidence in those decisions. This will help you to see how your decisions affect your outcomes. It'll also protect you from getting suddenly excited by an idea and making a bad decision because you're overexcited which is something I think I could safely say we've all done at some point. As you get more feedback, you'll eventually realize that one of the old techniques you've been using is ineffective. And that means you need to unlearn it, which is much easier said than done. To avoid falling back into these ineffective habits, it's helpful to get feedback early on to correct bad techniques before you become too used to them. But what if it's too late and you've already developed a bad technique? Well, you can add a constraint to your practice to make it impossible to do so. My favorite example from the book is that if you want to practice hitting a tennis ball in the middle of your racket, just use a smaller racket. That will make it impossible for you not to hit the ball in the middle, so you can't rely on your old bad technique. Finally, the author talks about the one emotion that stops most people from ever getting good feedback. Fear. We naturally try to avoid things we're scared of. Fear helps to keep us alive, but isn't helpful when it comes to the fear of embarrassment or failure when we're learning something new. Even worse, the more you avoid a fear, the more your brain reinforces this behavior as a solution. So over time, the fear becomes scarier and harder to overcome. The solution is through forcing exposure. If you try something and you get good feedback, your brain quickly realizes there's nothing to worry about. Imagine finally stepping on stage at an open mic night and it goes well. You'd very quickly get over the fear of stepping on stage. But what if you absolutely tank and get booed off stage? Well, interestingly, this can still reduce anxiety if you stick with it. After a while, you'll realize getting booed off stage actually doesn't impact your life at all. So even though it's a negative experience, you'll get over the fear of it. So really, you just need to start getting feedback as soon as possible. Good or bad, it'll be okay. Now that we've covered the core concepts, I want to share with you some practical tips that you can use to start implementing them. The first is about how to adjust your learning as your experience increases. Throughout this book, it becomes clear that the key to both learning and practice is achieving the right balance of structure and difficulty. Take a look at this diagram. Across the top here, you have experience. On the left is when you're just starting out, in the middle is when you're an intermediate, and on the right, an expert. You'll see at the start that you want to keep your tasks and your learning very structured. Structure has lots of benefits. It'll help you to avoid becoming overwhelmed due to overloading your working memory. It'll help you to make clear progress, which we know is good for motivation. And it will help you to practice just one part of a skill at a time, which is good for managing the difficulty level. To start doing this, you can use very structured learning materials like an online course. And for your practice, just try copying other people's work to start with. Copying simplifies the process and allows you to commit those parts of the skill to memory. Then, as you become more experienced, you want to slowly move from structured learning and practice to unstructured. A good task in the middle is to copy someone else's work, but to change something about it. Then slowly remove structure as you gain more confidence. Eventually you'll be working on entirely unstructured learning and creating new work. Research has shown that these tasks aren't only the most fun, but they're also the most effective for learning at this stage. And finally, I want to talk about the two actions that anyone can take to improve their learning straight away. As I read the book, I realized that you could get the benefits from most of the tips by just doing two things. First, join a community of people working on things similar to yours. A good community has loads of benefits. They help you to avoid your own biases when analyzing your own methods and progress. They also help to reduce the fear attached to trying new things. They'll help to celebrate your wins and support you through the harder points. Plus you'll have people to help you when you get stuck in your practice. And finally, they'll help to give you regular corrective feedback. And the next action is to get a coach. They'll also help with quick, corrective feedback. They can help regulate the difficulty of your practice for you, and you can learn directly from them. The book makes it clear that it's best to find someone that can show you how to do things and not just tell you. That way, you can get all the benefits from watching the process and avoid that step-skipping issue that we talked about earlier. Funnily enough, I read this book as part of my research into creating an environment for helping people accomplish hard things like launch a business or learn a high value skill. Luckily, it reinforced what I'd found in my own research. Community and direct coaching are some of the most effective methods for success, when they're done right. And I promise I didn't just force this conclusion to promote something. I wasn't even planning on mentioning this project until it was closer to being ready. But this bit reaffirmed for me just how important these things are when you're trying to accomplish something hard or learn something new. So if you want to stay up to date on that project, hit the link in the description. Or if you enjoyed learning about this book, I've got a video about the author's other book, Ultra Learning, which you can watch by clicking here. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great day.